Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Do nuclear weapons make us safer? Are we really better off if we have more nuclear weapons? Today we're going to talk about this and other aspects of having nuclear weapons. My guest today is an expert in this area. My guest today is Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu. She is the Under Secretary General and High Representative for the United Nations Disarmament Affairs. Prior to taking this post, Ms. Nakamitsu served as Assistant Administrator of the Crisis Response Unit at the UN Development Program. Ms. Nakamitsu, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being with me today. You've, you're in a very important area and a very volatile area too. And we're gonna get into this in just a moment. But let's talk a little bit about your Office for Disarmament Affairs. Uh, when was it formed and what is your main mission? Well, um, you know, as you know, the UN keeps reforming and then restructuring. Um, mm -hmm. So the name of the office changed a couple of times in the UN's history. But um, the first uh, a creation of my office, it was at the time it was called mm -hmm. Division for Disarmament. Mm -hmm. uh, that was created, I understand, in uh, 1977. So it goes back quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be within the Department for Political Affairs. And then, the, as I said, the name um, changed a few times. At, at some point it was a center, at some point it was a department. Mm -hmm. But the current form, Office for Disarmament Affairs, uh, came into you know its shape in 2007 um, and of course the mandate is to support the multilateral efforts towards achieving um, general and complete disarmament under strict and international control mm -hmm. um, and that obviously includes nuclear disarmament as well and, mm -hmm. and many other aspects of disarmament yeah, efforts. It certainly does yes and our viewers can go to your website at un.org backslash disarmament to learn more about what you're mm -hmm. doing. Now, I think it was in May of this past year, this, uh, the Under Secretary, or the Secretary General, not Under Secretary General, Secretary General Antonio Guterres of the United Nations came up with a disarmament agenda. What was the overall theme of that disarmament agenda and, and uh, maybe two or three of the main points? Um, sure. Um, the overall title of that disarmament agenda is Securing Our Common Future. And uh, it is a very comprehensive set of disarmament agenda, not just nuclear, uh, but, you know, conventional weapons and also the implication of science and technology uh, on international peace and security. So um, it is a, a very uh, comprehensive set of very practical, actionable, um, you know, issues covering uh, entire um, international peace and security and the disarmament area. Um, some themes, um, there are four pillars of the, the agenda. The first one is disarmament to save humanity. That's obviously uh, nuclear weapons and other strategic weapons. The second pillar is uh, disarmament that saves lives. Conventional weapons, the impact of um, you know, those uh, small arms and other types of conventional weapons on, on, on humans, on, on our lives. And then the third pillar is the science and technology uh, impacting or about to impact our security. It's entitled uh, Disarmament for Future Generations. And the fourth and the final pillar is Partnership for Disarmament. Uh, we felt very strongly that we need to really reinforce and, and further strengthen our general partnership for disarmament, uh, a little bit like uh, what it used to be, um, you know, more people to be interested mm -hmm. and then taking part in disarmament efforts. Mm -hmm. And those are very, this sounds very comprehensive. It sounds like you've covered the waterfront on that. I'm glad you mentioned number two about conventional arms. We so often forget mm -hmm. that. We think about the big nuclear weapons, the ICBMs and different That's ones right. like that, but that, that is very important yeah. also. Uh, is there anything in the Secretary General's disarmament agenda to encourage the nuclear powers to come back to the table to, to negotiate together and not maybe strike bilateral arrangements and different things like that? Absolutely, quite a few. I mean, also just to, to paraphrase this, I mean, this is our actions, this is the UN system actions. Mm -hmm. Of course, disarmament is also a responsibility uh, of um, member states and governments. Um, but we wanted to have this agenda to really support the member states' actions and then push the member states
states to fulfill their responsibility for uh, disarmament. So in the nuclear area, one of the first uh, uh, and a very important priority actions that we are um, you know, trying to undertake is definitely to encourage those nuclear weapon states to return to a dialogue path. Um, first and foremost, when the international security environment is getting very difficult, um, one important uh, element for achieving our common objective is for those countries to return to sincere, productive and substantive dialogues. And then we are standing ready definitely to facilitate if there is um, in fact a, a need and a request from, from those countries to facilitate. And we have a number of concrete ideas for that as well. Mm, exactly. Now we've been hearing a lot more lately about cyber warfare, uh, killer robots, uh, use of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Was Were those items discussed in that, uh, were, I know you're dealing with them, but were they included in that agenda? Absolutely, yes. Um, that's uh, in the third pillar, the, mm -hmm. the disarmament for future generations. Uh, we talk a lot about um, you know, how UN really needs to start actually taking a little bit more, um, if you will, innovative approaches. Mm -hmm. For example, using our convening palm, the UN still is looked at, you know, as uh, one of the, uh, um, you know, key actors that can bring different entities together, you know, including the private sector, the researchers, scientists and engineers, uh, mm -hmm. to, to bring together those different actors, in addition to, of course, member states, the government uh, um, um, representatives, uh, so that we can actually start uh, creating or help create global culture for accountability, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, adherence to, you know, emerging norms in cyber um, space, for example. Mm -hmm. um, there are already discussions taking place in the spheres of uh, cyber security, but also in AI, um, you know, what they call, what we call lethal autonomous weapon systems, laws, mm -hmm. uh, that is being discussed in the context of uh, a CCW, uh, Convention for Certain Conventional Weapons Mechanisms. So we are definitely uh, um, encouraging member states to, to, you know, take a greater responsibilities, and then we are doing a lot of work in these areas as well. Mm -hmm. Now, the UN took the lead also in 2017, you had the nuclear weapon ban treaty and that was a major landmark agreement what uh, what is the thrust of that and what is the status of it today yes so this uh, um, treaty was negotiated uh, here in New York uh, and it was adopted with 122 member states voting in favor um, as you can see, uh, you know, a lot of member states did not participate in the negotiation uh, of this treaty. Uh, but uh, still, a uh, majority of UN member states uh, supported the creation of this treaty. Um, it will go into effect. It's not, um, inf it's not in, in, uh, put into effect yet. Um, I think as of today, uh, there are 22 ratifications, the most recent one being South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, when they mm -hmm. have or when we have 50 ratifications, um, the, the treaty will, or 90 days afterwards, the treaty will uh, go into effect. So it's still in the process of, you know, collecting ratifications, etc. Mm -hmm. But the major, you know, achievement, uh, no doubt, it is in fact the only multilateral nuclear um, disarmament treaty that has been negotiated and adopted in, in more than 20 years. So from mm -hmm. that point of view, it is definitely uh, uh, very significant. Um, I, I think, um, you know, it, it's safe to say that it, w it has been mm -hmm. a very controversial treaty because nuclear weapon states obviously did not uh, participate and th there are still uh, very strong objections expressed by those nuclear weapon states and many of their um, allies. Um, but uh, the major objective is to, to, you know, ban the treaty, prohibit um, the entire aspects of nuclear weapons. Um, so it's a, it's a, you know, I, I think it was an expression by so many UN member states at a stalemate in nuclear disarmament mm -hmm. for so, so long. As I mentioned, uh, 20 plus years, nothing happened in a, a multilateral um, disarmament negotiations. Mm -hmm. And that frustration was felt by so many member states and, and that actually uh, resulted in this uh, prohibition treaty. Mm -hmm. And of course, nuclear weapons are very hard not only to build, I mean, to 
cost a lot to build them, but also to maintain them. I saw figures a few years ago where the United States alone spends like $125 million a day, I think it is, mm -hmm. to maintain the nuclear stockpile. That's a huge amount of money. That figure may be higher, maybe lower, I'm not mm -hmm. too sure, but it's still very expensive to do that. But also, do we not run the risk of accidents happening? I, I've read, of, I think, 12 since back in the 50s That's where we right. almost yes. had nuclear exchanges, yep. and all we need is one, and that could literally destroy the Earth. That's I mean, right. we don't need a small <laughs> nuclear weapon, yes. but just the uh, the fallout from that alone, right. the, uh, global, uh, the w global winter, I guess mm -hmm. is what they call it, would do us in. But, uh, what can we do to reduce this possibility of us having some type of an accidental exchange? We think there are actually quite a lot of things that we could do. Um, even, you know, it is a fact, uh, today the security environment is really deteriorating. The, the great power competitions are really, you know, getting mm -hmm. intense. But still, we think we can actually do a lot of things to um, reduce the risk of nuclear confrontations. I mean, just to give you very concrete um, um, steps, um, if you can improve the transparency of nuclear weapons programs by those, you know, nuclear weapon states, um, if you can reduce the operational readiness of nuclear weapons, uh, if you can also review and reduce the reliance or dependence, um, um, you know, in um, national security doc mil military doctrines over nuclear weapons. Um, these are all the measures that each of those nuclear weapon states can take that will in turn also build confidence uh, and, um, you know, um, I would say uh, greatly reduce the risk of nuclear accidents or incidents. Um, but also, you know, we are also trying to do a concrete and practical work at the multilateral levels as well. Um, one of the things that is, that is uh, ongoing at the moment is to develop a standard for uh, nuclear um, uh, disarmament verifications, for example. So there are measures that we could actually take in very practical, pragmatic uh, areas uh, which will contribute to not just reducing risks, but also eventually uh, uh, contribute to nuclear disarmament as well. That would be very helpful to provide confidence building and to make sure that people were not cheating. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any type of a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a website and you like our shows and would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're taking a look at this whole issue of nuclear weapons and conventional weapons also, and trying to determine if we're actually safer with them or with some better type of uh, controls or regulation of them. My guest today is an expert on this topic. My guest today is Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu, and she is the Under Secretary General and High Representative for the United Nations Disarmament Affairs. Madam Under Secretary General, we've got uh, so many nuclear <laughs> deals That's to right, deal with. Yes. Uh, lately, we've seen that, uh, well, Russia and the United States have walked, basically got now the INF, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty. And that was, it wasn't a perfect agreement, but still it was keeping them together talking That's about right. these issues. Uh, how dangerous is that with them withdrawing from that? Does that destabilize the situation a little more? We think so. Um, as you know, probably the Secretary General has noted um, with regrets um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the Russian and the US statements so far over the INF Treaty. You know, it was actually quite a significant treaty. It actually eliminated the entire class of uh, weapon systems. Um, and, um, and it has actually contributed to the en you know, end of the Cold War as such and also um, really stabilized uh, the security situations, in, in especially in Europe. Um, we still call upon both uh, parties uh, mm -hmm. to use the next six months or so to try and resolve the differences and therefore maintaining this, um, we hope that will still be the case. I think it is very important that, um, you know, even though the current um, disarmament and arms control agreements 
are obviously not perfect and they are new environments um, you know at the international level so probably it is true that they you know we need to start building a new vision for um, disarmament and arms control but before we have that new vision whatever that might be let's try to protect what what we have at the moment whilst at the same time we work towards having a better deal mm -hmm. um, so you know we are still calling on on two parties both of the parties to to try and resolve um, the, the their differences. Mm -hmm. um, what is important, of course, in an international agreement uh, is uh, the compliance issues uh, and also the old sort of wisdom of trust but verify. Mm -hmm. So there will have to be a concrete measures for verifications that would also increase the trust and confidence. Uh, so these are, you know, important elements of uh, um, having an effective international agreement and we very much still hope that uh, that will be a case um, yeah, exactly. when it comes to it. And you're so right. Trust but verify. Yes. <laughs> it has to, you have to have that confidence level that That's the right. other person, the other country is not getting it. Mm -hmm. Well, the UN has also been involved in 2014, I guess it was the Arms Trade Treaty. Yes. We're talking about small arms. Now we'll go to uh, yes. small arms. Yeah. Do that. What, what was the thrust of that particular treaty and where is it today? So um, this is a, a first, um, you know, um, treaty mm -hmm. uh, that created a norm over international transfer trade of conventional weapons. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, essentially, what it does is to to regulate international trade of uh, you know arms. Uh, to making sure that these arms are not going to the government, for example, if we know that governments are likely to use those weapons against civilians, or if we know or if we fear that uh, the government is likely to use um, you know, those weapons um, in, 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 in violation of human rights. So this is a um, you know, very important mm -hmm. tra uh, trading uh, agreement and um, you know, very positive um, today, uh, we have um, 100 uh, states parties ratifying this uh, uh, treaty. So it is now becoming a very uh, important instrument at the multilateral international level mm -hmm. that has really, um, I think, strengthened the norm um, of um, you know, making sure that the humanitarian impact of, of, of those conventional weapons will be mitigated and minimized. Mm -hmm. I remember back during the debate, and it was a very vigorous debate, yeah. as I recall, but I remember one group, the uh, U.S.-based National Rifle Association, which uh, represents a small number of gun owners mm. in the United States, and they were arguing against it, said that it was a violation of the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which gives Theoretically, individuals the right to bear arms. Really, it's for the militias, but we interpret it that way in the United States. But uh, that really is not the case, is it? Or uh, 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 how do you view that? No, <laughs> You're I mean the expert, I don't know. I'm I mean, not. <laughs> I, I wasn't here at the time, uh -huh. but I really don't understand how that misunderstanding or misrepresentation could 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 happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, a, a treaty that regulates international trade and right to bear arms uh, in the United States is strictly a domestic issue. So, you know, ATT Arms Trade Treaty really has absolutely nothing to do with, um, you know, the domestic U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, regulations uh, for the citizens of the United States. So that is absolutely not, uh, not the case. Yes, well, that there is so much bogus information out about the United Nations mm -hmm. that we hear all the time about. Uh, years ago, it used to be the John Birch Society talked about black helicopters, and then you hear about some of the talk show hosts saying the United States is taking over the parks and the rivers in the United States. And, uh, uh, the UN is taking over, which is not true. None of this is true, but we deal with the myths <laughs> as we come <laughs> to them. The, uh, the, really, the lynch, I guess the foundation for all of this, or a large part of it, is the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, yes. the NPT. Yes. Uh, that that's a very comprehensive treaty, but uh, when was that adopted and what does, why is that the underpinning for what we're trying to do today? Yes, no, thank you. I mean, NPT is, I think, widely considered as one of the cornerstones or important mm -hmm. pillar of uh, international security architecture today. Um, it has, <coughs> excuse me, 191 uh, states parties. Um, and uh, in 2020, we will have the review conference, mm -hmm. and that also coincides with the 50th year anniversary of the treaty uh, entering into force. So it's a very old treaty, or relatively old treaty, and I would say that it has been a, a, a you know successful treaty. 
that really underpins um, the, the security framework mm -hmm. uh, and architecture that as we as we have it today. You know, back in the 1960s, you know, people feared, generally speaking, that there will be 20 or 30 nuclear weapons st states. Mm -hmm. uh, but today, okay. it's uh, definitely less than half of that. So the treaty has managed to to make sure that the proliferation of nuclear weapons uh, will be prevented, and 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 so we think it's a, a hugely important treaty. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Now I've <coughs> read articles or glanced at articles that you you're very prolific. You've I've written some very good articles, and uh, two issues, two topics I know that you've mentioned before, the use of artificial intelligence mm. for good of humankind and also how you can empower women mm -hmm. to get, of course, that's the fifth goal, uh, yes. uh, sustainable development goal, that's I should right, say, which yes. is very important. We, uh, could you briefly comment on each of those? Sure. Um, so the um, artificial intelligence or, you know, I would say, uh, you know, rapid development of, um, you know, science and technology, mm -hmm. you know, some people say the fourth industrial revolution, right. all of those things. I mean, we, we still believe that the, 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 you know, it will be largely a positive thing for the humankind. Um, you know, it's been throughout the history, the development of science and technology has really benefited humankind. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is to make sure that that will continue to be the case. We also think that, um, you know, those AIs, for example, uh, could be uh, potentially really um, beneficial to the areas that we're dealing with, arms control and disarmament, you know, for example, mm -hmm. in the verification areas. Right. So we're not saying that this is, you know, an alarming thing and this will be a negative thing, but we just want to make sure that, um, you know, s the weapon systems, um, which is about to really, you know, change, um, has a potentially enormous impact on our society, the way um, the wars are being fought, the method and means of warfare. Uh, potentially it, will, it could have an impact on international law as well that regulates um, the conduct of war, etc. Um, the thing is that uh, we don't know exactly what kind of impact it will, it will be um, there um, because we don't know what kind of technologies will be there. So this, you know, we are dealing with a lot of unclarities, but we want to make sure that, for example, in the areas of uh, artificial intelligence, um, you know, we would not have weapon systems that would be fully autonomous mm -hmm. um, with the power <laughs> to take human lives be fully delegated to machines. Uh, that we, we think will be a problem. Um, so all these discussions, uh, as I said uh, earlier, are now starting to really uh, intensify mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that our values uh, will be protected, our international law will be also um, applicable in, in many of those critical areas. And we also want to um, work with scientists and engineers, uh, private sectors, to, to make sure that responsible innovation and application of technologies will make, sh you know, will, will be uh, uh, beneficial to, to us, uh, not the other way around, you know. So, I mean, those are the, the, the work that we are beginning to do. And it's uh, quite uh, interesting because it's not really a traditional way the UN works. I mean, UN is a multilateral intergovernmental entity. Um, but we're now starting to have much more um, intensified dialogues with private sector people uh, and we're learning a lot. Uh, we are developing our own thinkings and, and we hope that uh, we will have a, a useful uh, uh, conversations and then you know, moving the agenda forward to make us safer and, and more secure. Uh, on the women's issue, this is uh, uh, one of the uh, top priorities. Um, I mean, there are different dimensions. Uh, one is that we know that different weapon systems have different impacts between men and women. So we need to make sure that gendered impact will be carefully actually taken into consideration when we are making new norms, new agreements, etc. Um, so overall, um, we have to make sure that gender perspectives will be mainstreamed and, and fully taken into consideration. But also, 
women need to be fully and equally represented in the negotiations of, of all those um, um, disarmament. That is absolutely yes. imperative. But Under Secretary General Nakamitsu, you're dealing with a very important topic. It's one that literally is life and death for the, the entire planet. And we commend you for the excellent work that you're doing in this area. And we encourage all of the countries to get involved in this and to reduce the threat of nuclear risk. But I want to thank you so very much for thank a you. very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.